My name is Denise Lucy. I am the Executive Director of the Institute for Leadership Studies and a Professor of Business and Leadership, and it's my pleasure and honor to be the partner to Book Passage and Elaine and Bill Petruccelli, who helped to bring some of these speakers, all these speakers, to our community. And we've done this now for over a dozen years. Over 100 amazing leaders from across the disciplines have come to our campus and engage with our students and with you and our, and our neighbors. And the Institute for Leadership Studies is a leadership development center. Its goal is to help to promote leaders at all levels, offering both education, executive education, training, and forums like this. So we're really thrilled you could be here. Forbes has called Ariana Huffington one of the most influential women in the world. As co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Huffington Post, she is a remarkable leader who has profoundly changed the world in so many ways. And it's thrilling that she's here on our campus today. Without our sponsors, we could not pursue this endeavor, and so we, we really hope that you'll help welcome and thank them for doing so. Our lead sponsor for the last five years that has really helped us to expand this program is Private Ocean Wealth Management, Personal Powerful Wealth Management. It is one of the oldest and largest privately held wealth management firms in Marin and celebrated by Marin, excuse me, by Worth Magazine as one of the top 100 registered investment advisors nationwide and named a, one of the best places to work in the Bay Area. And it's, it's really my pleasure to be in partnership with them. So please join me in thanking Private Ocean for their support. Each year, both fall and spring, the Dominican Women Leadership and Philanthropy Council also help provides support and helps to uh, sponsor these programs. WLPC is a circle of women and community members focused on supporting Dominican programming, developing women as philanthropic leaders. I am proud to be one of those members. Please thank WLPC for their support. Just before the evening began, around from four to six, Huffington Post sponsored something called the Sleep Revolution Sleep Fair, where we had our students, faculty, and staff convene and meet all these amazing vendors that are supporting the goal of better sleep. We had so much fun. It was terrific. And uh, I just wanted to thank HuffPost for all they did to welcome our campus and get us energized about this important topic. Now, in to introduce Ms. Huffington tonight is Dr. Ruth Ramsey. She's a longtime board member of the Institute for Leadership Studies at our founding 12 years ago. She's been on the board ever since. And she is the professor of occupational therapy and the founding director of occupational therapy. And I'm so happy to let you know that from this experience of learning about the sleep revolution, I learned that Ruth is a researcher in sl about sleep. Was that, that's just perfect. <laughs> so I've, I've asked Ruth if she'd be so kind as to introduce Ms. Huffington tonight. So please welcome Dr. Ruth Ramsey. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucy. She's been a wonderful mentor and role model for me during my time here at Dominican. To list all her job titles, responsibilities, and achievements, it's a wonder that our guest tonight even has time to sleep. Fortunately, she does. Ariana Huffington is the co-founder, president, and editor-in-chief of the Huffington Post Media Group. She serves on numerous boards, including the Center for Public Integrity and the Committee to Protect Journalists. She is also a syndicated columnist and the prolific author of 15 books. Ms. Huffington has run for political office and has appeared in movies as an actress, yet she believes her greatest role in life may have been that of working mom, to which I concur. In May 2005, Ms. Huffington launched the Huffington Post, a popular and powerful online news platform, one of the most frequently cited media brands on the internet. In 2012, the site won a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Ariana has been named to Time Magazine's list of the world's 100 most influential people 
and the Forbes Most Powerful Women list. Yet, she does manage to get her sleep, which is a serious subject to Ariana, and should be a serious subject to all of us. She arrived at Dominican this afternoon to host her Sleep Revolution Sleep Fair on our campus. We are the second of several campuses nationwide where Ms. Huffington is hosting these fun and engaging fairs to help college students understand the importance of sleep. And I was also at the fair this afternoon, and I can say the interest was very high on the part of these young people. And I, I'm especially delighted that Ms. Huffington is investing in this younger generation, which of course is our future. Tonight, Ms. Huffington is here to discuss her 15th and newest book, The Sleep Revolution, Transforming Your Life One Night at a Time, which was published just this week. So please join me now in welcoming to Dominican and the Angelico Concert Hall stage, Ariana Huffington. Thank you so much. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. I can't tell you how great it was to be at the sleep fair with uh, all the students. Uh, as a mother of two daughters who recently graduated from college, I feel this is the demographic I most want to reach because they're the generation that is really change, going to change the culture around these ideas that sleep deprivation and burnout are the ways to succeed. For those of you who have not heard me before, um, this accent is for real. It's been a little bit the bane of my existence <laughs> until I um, met Henry Kissinger a few years ago. And uh, it wasn't his accent, it was the fact that he said to me, in American public life, you can never overestimate the advantages of complete and total incomprehensibility. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here again with Elaine Petrocelli, who is an all-time friend and I think such an incredible force of nature and such an incredible unknown. A powerhouse in this community. I must say, I. I also was. I, I love the coincidence that um, I was actually introduced by Dr. Ruth Ramsey, who herself has done a study um, in the on the impact of sleep deprivation on our public health, which is such an important area of new understanding. It's really been, for me, an incredible journey that started nine years ago, almost to the day, when I collapsed from sleep deprivation and exhaustion, and that started me on my journey of looking at the science, which is um, pretty conclusive now, as well as the history of how we came to devalue sleep. And so the book starts with a crisis, because that's really the beginning to realize that we are in a sleep deprivation crisis with over 40% of people not getting the sleep they need. And then moving on to this explosion of scientific understanding, just to give you an idea, um, the first sleep scientific center was founded in 1970 at Stanford. 1970 is very recent. And now there are over 2,500 centers all around the United States alone. And during that time, we have learned so much and we've realized that a lot of the things we believed are completely false. So in a sense, we are going from the dark, dark ages when it comes to the sleep science to the Renaissance. And um, of all the studies in the book, for the academics in the, in the audience, you'll be very happy to know there are 50 pages of scientific endnotes in the book. <laughs> I, don't, I don't expect every lay reader to look at them, but I wanted them there because I wanted to convince even the most stubborn skeptic that this is not debatable anymore. It's like climate change, it exists. <laughs> and you know, there are always going to be some deniers, but the science is in. 
So of all the multiple studies, the one that I find the most fascinating is the one that makes it clear that contrary to our belief, when we sleep, the brain indulges in the most amazing frenetic activity. So as Dr. Demand from Stanford said, we used to think that sleep is like putting the car in the garage and turning the ignition off. And now we know, if I can use a more modern metaphor, that it's actually like your car turning into a driverless car and running many essential errands for you. And the most essential errand is cleaning up all the toxins that accumulate during the day. This is the time when everything is washed away and you can start fresh. If that doesn't happen, it is actually really dangerous. They have now discovered a clear connection between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's. And you can see the two epidemics coinciding. Um, it's, as, as the scientist involved in the study put it, the brain can operate in two modes, either awake and alert, or asleep and cleaning up. It can't do both functions at the same time. So it's a little bit like you can either entertain the guests or clean up the house. <laughs> I was actually in Munich a few months ago doing a sleep panel with Professor Rottenberg, who is the most celebrated sleep scientist in Germany. And he had another great metaphor. He said, if you don't sleep enough, it's a little bit like stopping the laundry machine before the wash is clean. Isn't that an amazing metaphor? It's like you have to complete the cycle because our brain and our body go through all these different cycles, the REM cycle, the deep sleep cycle, and if you don't complete all the cycles, you end up with half clean laundry, which is not fun. So I'm fascinated by all the science, and I hope you will be too. And the reason why I really urge you to read the book in order is because I feel by the end of it, if you read it in order, you will be convinced of the importance of sleep and be willing to make the small changes in your life to actually get all the sleep you need. So you read about the crisis, you read about the science, and then for me, the question that I wanted to answer in the book is, how did that happen? How did we come to devalue and scorn sleep? Because after all, it's the culture. So my goal here is with your help to begin to really change the culture so that people would look back at the way we lived and consider it barbaric and be grateful that a new dawn has broken, which truly allows people to operate from their best. And that's why we chose to start with colleges, because it is so important to reach this generation, which is the most stressed generation. And now, as anybody will tell you who is involved with college students, if you scratch the surface of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, binge drinking, drugs, at the bottom, there is sleep deprivation. Because all these other problems become exaggerated. So we've launched these social media campaigns. We'd love you to participate. Um, our hashtag is sleep revolution. Um, you can take a picture of your nightstand. That's one of the campaigns. Because we are encouraging people, whether they're in, in a college dorm or in a beautiful home, to turn their nightstand into the equivalent of a little altar. Instead of being where you put all your junk and you charge your phones <laughs> to create, I mean, I have mine on my Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, right now you're only going to get quotes about sleep and pictures about sleep. But we are having this incredible response from students. We started in Denver yesterday. We are here today. Uh, we're at Berkeley and Stanford on um, Monday, and at Stanford, I'm actually doing a conversation 
who is uh, Andre Inguadola, who is the MVP from the Golden State Warriors. And, uh, <laughs> and you'll see in the book, I, I write his story in the book, how he changed his sleep habits and he attributes uh, becoming an MVP to the fact that he now gets eight hours sleep and has become a huge sleep champion. So I thought it'd be great to bring him to Stanford to speak to the students who um, admire him and can therefore help see that it is actually a performance enhancer. And um, the other campaign we launched is against drowsy driving that now kills more and more people every year, 8,000 8, last year, 1.2 million crashes. And um, we've launched a petition at change.org. We'd love you to go sign it. That basically is a pledge not to drive while drowsy and not to let friends drive while drowsy. So taking the, the designated driver campaign and applying to fatigue, which is much harder for people to recognize. Most people know when they are drunk, but they think they can power through being tired. And the truth is they can't. And it takes like two seconds of micro sleep for a terrible crash. So this is really for me um, a crusade right now. And I feel that we have the opportunity to accelerate change that are already happening and to create a critical mass that changes the way we live our lives and dramatically improves both our lives personally and at work. And let us not forget the mystery of sleep. The easy entry point is to look at sleep as a performance enhancer, but there is also an incredible mystery to sleep. And so every night is also a reminder that we are something more than our successes and our failures, our comings and our goings. And every night for me is a reminder that life is a dance between making it happen and letting it happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go over there and ask Ariana some of your questions. I have more questions. You would have to stay three weeks if we got to all of them. But one very interesting one that came to me a little while ago was uh, from a person who says, I have to travel in my work. I try not to get jet lag, but I am always sleepy at meetings. What do you recommend? So first of all, it's perfectly natural when you change time zones for your body to be on one time zone and you to be on another time zone. And for me, um, a few keys here have to do, first of all, what you do on the plane. If you change time zones, it's a relatively long flight. So there are certain nonos. Now, ideally, no alcohol on the plane, uh, an enormous amount of water <laughs> so that you hydrate your body. And I travel with a little um, kit that we gave to all the students here who came to the fair of an eye mask, earplugs, you know, things that will make it easier to sleep. Also, in the book, there is an index of 12 meditations. I picked out of hundreds my favorites that help you to sleep. Whether you're a meditator or not, I know the university here encourages meditation, has a lot of programs, which is great. But even if you don't meditate, Playing meditations is one of the most soothing things you can do. Now, of the 12 that I picked, you may hate 11. I bet you're going to like at least one of them. I have two on that list that I have never listened to the end because I always fall asleep before. <laughs> so again, you need to experiment. And, um, and then try not to schedule a meeting as soon as you arrive in Tokyo or Shanghai. It's just barbaric. And it's actually embarrassing how often CEOs get off a plane, they go to a meeting, and they fall asleep at a meeting when people have been working sometimes for months 
to present them with a PowerPoint. <laughs> so we are not superhuman. We need to acknowledge the limitations of changing time zones and work that into our schedule. That's great. Um, I know a lot of people take uh, sleeping pills, uh, especially when they get on a plane. How do you recommend people who become somewhat dependent on sleeping pills, who would never tell you they were dependent on drugs, uh, change that? So, first of all, we need to understand that sleeping pills were never intended to be a regular part of our lives. Unfortunately, they're advertised as though they're a regular part of our lives. And then they have 92 side effects presented over cheerful images um, <laughs> of playful, happy people. Um, the side effects being, you know, while on Ambien, you may actually get in your car and effectively kill somebody because you have no memory, and this has happened. And there is such a thing now as the Ambien defense. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't times in one's life when you, some, you know, you've lost somebody, um, you're going through a traumatic experience, you need a sleeping pill, but it can't be a daily occurrence because the consequences are, are very severe, again, including in terms of our health. So I would recommend that you try a lot of alternatives, and there, are, there is everything in the book, you know, from acupuncture to yoga stretches before you go to sleep to um, natural herbs to Chinese medicine. You know, there's so much because the heart of it is what is happening in our brains. And when we learn to slow down the brains, we can function without sleeping pills or needing them very, very rarely. I have a couple of questions here from young parents who say they're not getting enough sleep because their children aren't sleeping. Uh, can you comment right. on that? Yes, I have a whole section on the book because, of course, when your children are young, that's one of the hardest times when it comes to sleep deprivation. And in fact, sleep deprivation is very connected with postpartum depression. So what is important here is, first of all, to keep reminding yourself that your children are going to grow up. <laughs> and they are going to go to sleep normally for the whole night. But until that time, what is essential is to try and sleep when they sleep to really kind of go on their rhythm and to create a tribe of support. I mean, I was very lucky my Greek mother lived with me when my babies were born. But create like a tribe, a little tribe. You can exchange, you know, you can support them. They support you because it's, I think, what makes it so hard for young couples, especially having children whose parents are living far away, is that they are trying to do it by themselves. Oh, and one more thing about couples having young children. Don't be a martyr. No reason for both of you to be up. <laughs> no reason for both of you to be exhausted. I mean, I don't understand this idea that, oh, I'm just going to support her. No, you're not supporting her. You are both staying up, and you are both going to want to kill each other in the morning. <laughs> So take turns, you know, who, who has to get up early in the morning, who has an important meeting, they should go to sleep, and the other one should take care of the baby. That leads me to a couple of very interesting questions here about the person you sleep with, not who you sleep with, that's not our business. <laughs> but but uh, I was interested that we got a couple of questions from people who said, well, I want to go to sleep early, but the person that I sleep with seems to want to go to sleep later, and then that person, I won't say which sex, although it does on one of the cards, um, comes in bed with an iPad, and then I can't sleep. Can you save this marriage? <laughs> so I don't know if you want to reveal yourself, because I have a very important question, which is, do you have a room in the house you can convert to a second bedroom? <laughs> because this is kind of essential for your marriage. Um, there will be nights when you can compromise and go to sleep at the same time and leave the iPad outside the room. But until that happens, 
it's really important to have a second bedroom where you can go and sleep. With, otherwise, resentment is, becomes exponential, especially when you're exhausted and sleep deprived. There is absolutely nothing wrong. It is absolutely common among European royalty to sleep apart, come together to have sex, and then go your separate ways, sleep, be fully recharged in the morning, and come together again. I don't know where this idea that you have to sleep together every night to have a happy marriage came from. Actually, that should be a good book, Elaine. <laughs> I'll do the interviews. <laughs> <laughs> a couple people want to know if it's possible to be getting too much sleep, I'm hoping. Uh, but, but has any of the research shown a problem with sleeping too much? Well, yes, if you have narcolepsy. You know, unless you have narcolepsy, uh, you cannot sleep too much. You can eat too much, but you cannot sleep too much. So um, you don't have to worry about that. I think the, the most wonderful thing is when you can wake up naturally without an alarm. Because just think of it, the word alarm. <laughs> We're starting our days with an alarm, with, with cortisol, the stress hormone flooding our bodies. Do you know what is at the heart of 75% of healthcare problems and healthcare costs in this country is stress? 75%. And every morning, most of us start our day in a stressful way. That, uh, you know, Bill and I used to get up with an alarm in the morning, and all of a sudden, we looked at each other one day and said, our children have grown up. We don't have to get up at 6 anymore. <laughs> it's a great thing. I love it. You, bring, you have to write about it on the Huffington Post. <laughs> And that brings me to another question, because I have several questions here about the fact that we, some of us feel that the Huffington Post is part of our community. And we'd like to know, what's your vision for the Huffington Post, and how can we be part of it? Thank you. Well, first of all, you, you are part of it. Both you and Bill have written for the Huffington Post. And I would love to invite all of you to write about anything that's on your mind, including your sleeping habits. <laughs> and uh, to make it super easy, I'm going to give you my email address so you can email me directly, ariana at huffingtonpost.com. And uh, for me, that's one of the best things about Huffington is that we are a community. We just launched a great series that Elaine, you said you'll participate in that actually was created by my oldest daughter, Christina, called Talk To Me, where we have grown children interviewing their parents. And it's been amazing. We launched it last week with Sam Branson interview interviewing Richard, and uh, Oprah being interviewed by three of her adopted daughters from South Africa. And uh, I was interviewed by Christina. And it's opened up now to everybody to interview um, their parents, and it's just a great, something great to have, uh, share with the grandchildren, and uh, create, again, another ripple of community. That is beautiful. I think so many of us think we're going to do that, and yes. we don't get a lot around to it, and then it's too late. Well, Ariana, thank you so much for your generosity with us tonight, and for your beautiful book, and just for every day that we can follow all that you're doing. We're just thrilled you were here. Thank, Thank you. you.